wow. I mean, okay, so I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic about the future of Britain uh, following that. Actually, my, my, my staff had a conversation, um, and one person said, um, you know, I've got this really great idea. We should start with the very young, and then by contrast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, unusually for me, uh, given my natural optimism, let's start with the... Uh, the bad news. Britain's situation is perilous. We need policies which short term, i.e. within one parliament, will get the economy moving and we need a long term plan for the country's future. We can debate how we got here, but where we are is grim. The British state is unsustainable. We are spending more than ever before in British history, except in times of crisis or war, and taxing more with poor outcomes. Waiting lists trebled since 2010, crimes leading to a charge, a third of what they were even in 2015. This generation, half as likely as the last to be homeowners by the age of 30, and two million children in receipt of free school meals, and that's a third above the long-term average. Now, all our competitors, it's true, have seen falls in growth and productivity since the financial crisis, but Britain has fallen most. And what that does is it depletes further still the money available for public spending. Taxes and receipts would be 130 billion pounds higher if we kept pace just with the G7 not with the growth in the early part of this century. And meaning that since 2007, the average UK worker has received no real pay rise. Now, Brexit, yep, it's had a significant impact. The UK foreign direct investment inflows are at their lowest level since the 1980s. And business investment, British business investment, has underperformed since Brexit. All of that is for sure. And the Brexit damage is unique to Britain. But the structural challenges are the same all over the developed world and are the product of a combination of deep economic societal change together with profound policy dysfunction where the actions of the state have not kept pace with what is happening in the real world. Because it's not just the level of spending, but the composition, which is alarming. So spending in areas necessary but unproductive has risen much faster than investment in areas essential for future economic success. Over the last three decades or so, spending on disability benefits increased more than increased spending on education, spending on social care more than transport, Increased spending on pensions, more than housing and research and development increases combined. Health spending increased by a massive 165 billion, more than all the productive areas put together, but only an extra 6 billion of that 165 went on capital investment. And, yep, the pressures are going to get worse because of an aging population. Another 3.4 million elderly in the next 20 years, with the over 50s today holding 78% of the housing wealth. So, we've got two challenges. One, to make the state sustainable. And second, to raise Britain's growth and productivity levels and become leaders in the economy of the future. And both require fundamental reforms. The question is how? And finally, here is some good news. We live through an era of unprecedented technological advance. This 21st century technology revolution is every bit as radical in its effect as the 19th century industrial revolution. Now, like any change, it has risks as well as opportunities, but already, just look at how dramatically it has changed the nature of the private sector. Compare the top 10 global companies today 
and at the turn of the last century. The purple of the tech, three, in July 2003, now eight out of the 10. And not only service companies, but new manufacturing ones. And their, their behemoths. In 2003, the largest company was General Electric, just under 300 million market cap. Today, it's Apple at three trillion. That is, by the way, more than the annual GDP of the whole of the French economy. And if you take the top 20 economies in the world and match it with the eight top tech companies' market cap, you get a sense of the size of the change. What's more, their research and development spending is vastly superior to government. Five of the tech giants invest more than Britain's government, and Amazon alone three times as much. So we're in the middle of this tech revolution. You've got big data, mobile and cloud, artificial intelligence, and now a new revolution through generative artificial intelligence. And here's how some of the people are describing it. It's like the invention of the printing press. It's going to be the most beneficial technology for humanity ever. That's from our own demos. We're only at the beginning of what AI can accomplish. Whatever limitations it has today will be gone before we know it, from Bill Gates. And already, Tech is changing how we live, the way we shop, what we watch, uh, even how we date, and the jobs we do. And now, this is going to accelerate at a faster pace than ever before. And here's the challenge. Though the world is changing, the state is not. These are the main areas of public service employment and the changes since the end of last century. The composition of the jobs is largely unchanged. There's just more of them. In addition, we have no national data infrastructure in health or across government, no digital ID, which is preconditional for a fully digital state, few incentives for public sector innovation, and at least until recently, no drive from the center to engage with the transformation of government that is possible through technology. Yet this technology revolution allows us not just to reform the state, but in time to reimagine it entirely. How it operates, who it employs, what it does. A state that's more strategic, which is empowering, not overpowering, and where it works with the private sector in partnership to create the economy of the future. Just two examples. Take health. Individual factors, we know, are the biggest determinants of illness and are preventable, with personal choices and behaviors alone causing half of all illness. And we're learning what technology can do to change it in prevention, detection, and cure. So proper use of NHS data could save up to 10 billion pounds a year, and that was according to a 2019 assessment. It'll be much higher today. According to a report just issued last week, real-time data could help reduce hospitalizations by 60%. 30 million people now use the NHS app, which could form the basis of an electronic health record. And monitoring from wearables can improve lifestyles and in time, we'll be able to detect a whole range of illnesses. Then genomics can identify risks, help prevent disease. Cell and gene therapies and messenger RNA are opening up new possibilities in curing disease, including cancer and heart disease. And of course, AI. An AI-discovered drug for lung disease is already in clinical trials. Clinical trials themselves will be dramatically changed and develop drugs and AI-enabled technologies will be able to detect eye disease, cancer, heart disease, and strokes. And of course, automation through AI can ensure healthcare professionals have more time to spend on direct patient care. So when we talk about NHS reform in the future, utilizing technology is going to be fundamental to that reform. A second example. Modern cloud systems, by combining different sets of data, could help target state interventions and save money. 
It's just two, furlough support during COVID, household support in the energy crisis, huge and targeted interventions. Now, even if we saved a fraction of those sums, it would be massive. There's more good news. This is a revolution in which Britain and British business can play a crucial role. Because technology is also the key which unlocks Britain's industrial future. Britain has big advantages in this new economy. It's got world-class universities, the largest finance sector in Europe, third behind the US and China in venture capital, the leader in Europe for artificial intelligence talent, and fourth globally for so-called unicorns, that's startups valued at over a billion dollars. But we're slipping. So UK IPOs have declined to just 5% of the global total, which reduces the attractiveness of London as a financial center. We don't have enough compute capacity. We've got declining AI research papers. Only one of the 27 major advances in synthetic biology of the past decade have come from the UK. And FDI in our life sciences fell by 47% last year. My point is very simple. None of these things are hard to fix. They just need the full concentrated focus of government to fix them. And here is the big political message. This technology revolution isn't an interesting sideshow on the margins of traditional politics. It should change them as completely as it's changing the world. Of course, like any technology, there are dangers. Now, I've concentrated today on the opportunities, but we could do a, a whole other presentation for you just on the risks, which are also huge. But in political terms, small p political terms, it goes to the same point. Understanding, mastering, and harnessing the 21st century technology revolution is the 21st century progressive political mission. In the same way that ultimately, mastering the 19th century industrial revolution became the mission, first, of the Liberal Party in the 19th century, and then the Labour Party over 100 years ago. Otherwise, for progressive politics, the danger is it retreats to a version of old-fashioned state intervention, which now manifests itself in anti-globalization sentiment, forgetting the enormous benefits open trade and markets have brought the world or a new-fashioned identity politics, which risks mirroring the divisiveness of the far right, not defeating it. So that is our basic analysis. However, we live in the here and now. This is all about the future, but the here and now. Ryan, Ryan Wayne, who uh, is one of our great hopes at uh, TBI, is now going to outline for you the four things that we could do in the first years of any parliament to get growth going. Ryan, over to you.